I'll admit all four of these songs kind of hold a special place in my heart. I actually liked all of these songs, <laughs> admittedly, uh, growing up. I'll admit to that. Um, but let me ask you this. So there, there, um, there's something that's in co that is in common with all four of these songs. Does anyone know what that is? I'm gonna have a... That's close. It's close. Not quite. Is it the same uh, funky drummer beat? Yes. Good, good call. So come up here. Finish this talk. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> So yeah, exactly. So they all sample the same beat, the drum break, Funky Drummer by James Brown. Cool. So that's actually one of the most sampled drum breaks ever. I think it's listed in about almost 900 different songs. Um, and all those songs, the four songs that I mentioned, obviously they were sampled, but they also, there's something else that they had in common. They all were number one Billboard hits at some point in their history, um, where ironically, James Brown, the original song, only ever made it as high as, as 20. So the point I'm, I'm trying to make there, and I think Mark Twain sums it up really nicely, um, is that there's, this is my, my thought, is like there's, there's no such thing as a new idea. We simply take a lot of old ideas and put them into a sort of mental kaleidoscope. We give them a turn and they make new and curious combinations. We keep on turning and making new combinations indefinitely, but they are the same old pieces of colored glass that have been used through all the ages. So, you know, when I think about crossover, and I was thinking about this, this talk, that I thought about music right away. I think there are a lot of different examples that, are, that we could also go to, but I think it's all about uh, you know, different combinations of different pieces of colored glass um, that, we, that we have to think about. So when I think about the way that my career has, has happened, I've kind of taken a, a roundabout, unconventional way to where I am now. And it's really kind of crossed three main areas. Uh, phys physical, digital, and business. And really the, the, the kind of drum break for me is the ability to understand people and understand behavior and, and kind of figure out why they're, they're doing what they're doing. So I'll start with the, the physicality of people. So really my work and my interest really started in the physical sense. So I wasn't, I wasn't a computer, computer science major. I wasn't actually not, not a formally trained anything, really. I wasn't I'm not a, design, a formally trained designer in the, in the common sense. But what I, where I did start was just learning. Um, I studied human factors in ergonomics. So it was all about the physical, how people interact with physical things, physical spaces. And it was a lot about biomechanics and you know, what are the forces and how, how can we make things easier for people to use. Lots of standards, lots of military stuff. Um, you know, it was interesting for a little while and then it just gets really mundane and boring because you're just re regurgitating the same thing over and over again. So, you know, as I was finishing school, I, I, I thought to myself, hmm, there's got to be a better way to apply this philosophy, this way of thinking. And it turned out that there was a, a program kind of a crossover with Emily Carr and Simon Fraser where they were pair, pairing human factor students with uh, industrial design students at Emily Carr. So I'm like, yeah, I'm all, I'm all over that. Let's, let's do it. So we, we ended up going to Emily Carr back and forth, getting paired with an industrial designer. Um, and that's kind of where I got my first foray into working in kind of product design and even user interface design. And uh, so the first thing, what we ended up creating was, was this. So sorry if it's fuzzy. This thing is, I don't know, I think it's about 14 years old now. It's really blurry. It's printed on transparencies. It was designed for a Palm Pilot. Um, way back in the day. But I, I show this to you because um, it actually holds a, a pretty significant uh, part of my life in terms of my, getting my career started. We called this the, the, the Behavioral Observation System, uh, the BOS for short, but I look at it now and it's more like a POS, honestly. Uh, it's not very good. But uh, the thing with this is that it uh, really allowed me to get, go through design process. Um, understand what it was like to work with other designers and take kind of make that shift between understanding physical behavior and interaction with 
kind of human computer interaction and kind of move into a digital space. So as I was graduating from school, I, I, I worked for a couple of years at a consultancy doing a lot of human factor stuff, a lot of industrial type things, you know, beer can lines, ferries, all that sort of stuff. And that was, that was cool. But at the same time, I saw a shift and the need to move to digital. So I ended up uh, having lunch with some, some folks at Nokia. They were opening up an office in Vancouver around that time. I think it was 2003, 2004-ish. Um, so I had lunch with them and I was really interested in the job. And I, I still remember this quote to this day. We were having lunch and they, say to me, they said to me, you've never designed anything for mobile or even digital. Why do you think you would be able to do this job? So I was like, that is a very good question. <laughs> Let me talk to you about this. <laughs> so uh, in all honesty, I did talk about this. This is something that I talked about in the interview. Uh, I showed it. I talked about the process behind it and the thinking behind it. And that was actually good enough to get me the job. Um, so you know, what the point I'm trying to make is like there's, there's relevancy in everything. You can find connections and crossover and everything. It's just about making those things meaningful to the people that you're, you're talking to and the people that you're trying to, to design for. So I get the job at Nokia, you know, it's my first day, really excited. I get there and then they hand me my package and then they give me this. So that was my, that was my first big boy phone, that was my corporate phone. I was so excited, I thought I was living in the future. It even did this, it flipped open, you could play Doom on it, it was amazing. So I started my time there at Nokia, we were doing a lot of physical design. So I was working with a lot of the industrial designers, which is, which is cool. Um, and you know, as, as a result of that, uh, this was the first project, product that I actually shipped. So the iPhone had just come out. Nokia was like, oh shit. Um, and then we needed to create the iPhone killer, which was what this was supposed to be. So th does anyone have this phone or did anyone? <laughs> no? Oh, OK. Um, so yeah, so obviously that's what that, that happened. Um, <laughs> And it also, you know, we had a kickstand in it, which was our like big feature. Funny enough, this is what got all the press and we got everyone talking. It's like, oh, there's a built-in kickstand. You can watch videos without having to, having to hold it. Amazing. <laughs> but not enough to dethrone the iPhone. <laughs> so, you know, as we're going on, there's, a, there's an interesting shift happening. So you, we're moving from hard, uh, kind of hardware product to actual software digital, right? So Nokia saw that. They're trying to make the make the shift. And at the same time, you know, phones were just starting to look like this. Like, it almost didn't matter what the industrial design was. It was just basically a big piece of glass, um, big slab, and it was all about the software. This one, this is a, a plastic model of like a concept that we were, were working on. Also has a kickstand. <laughs> this was the, uh, the era of the kickstand at Nokia for some reason. I don't think most people haven't, haven't seen this because I have a collection of stuff at home. But anyway, so we would take this around. We would you know, show it to people. We'd talk about it. But ultimately, it, it didn't really matter. And it was more about, OK, what's the next thing? And then for me, the next thing was about you know, this idea of the digitization of people. So we started in physical, you know, moving towards digital, and a whole other shift in mindset around how do you, how do you deal with, with that? So um, you know, what we started to do was think about uh, ex like overall experiences. So it wasn't just about this phone. It was about what are, what are all the experiences around that. And that in it involved a lot of, you know, digital pieces and things. And so what we did was in order to kind of communicate that to the executive team, to people that we wanted to convince that this was the right way to go, we had to figure out a way to do that because, you know, it wasn't about creating this piece of plastic anymore. So we borrowed a, a technique from our friends in the movies and in, uh, in film and television, and we created storyboards. So this is, uh, this is about, I don't know, seven years old now, so it's not very good. Um, but the whole point here is that, you know, we created these storyboards, uh, and this is what we would use to talk through like our ideas, right? Different scenarios, here's how someone would interact with this thing. So this was right around the time Netflix started streaming video. So that was about seven years ago, I think, was, that, was when that happened. Um, and so if you look at this now, you're like, oh, that's stupid. That's, you know, I, I just did that this morning, I think. Um, but it was, it was just mind blowing for us at the time. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, there's, there's a lot of different pieces that go into actually creating something and getting something commercially uh, viable that, that, that works like that. Um, so, you know, shifting my mindset more towards digital, you know, I start to notice the different things. Um, what I have up here is Frank and Oak. Is anyone familiar with Frank and Oak? It's like a 
you know, menswear, online menswear, um, they ship clothes to you every month uh, for whatever you pick. Um, so I've been a member of Frank and o for a while, um, and I actually thought they were doing something really interesting. So this is a, a screenshot from one they were right at the beginning. Um, so it's a bit of an older design, but there's a, cu there's a couple of, there's one thing that I wanted to, to call out here that I thought they were doing just, uh, a good job of. So if you'll notice that up in the very top right corner there, there's, it says profile and there's a little red number and there's a, there's a dollar value, right? So basically what they were doing is every time you'd buy something, they'd actually kick you kick back a little bit of money towards um, what you've just purchased. So ultimately, you, you're, you never have zero in your Frank and Oak account. You always have some money. So I thought, oh, these guys are, these guys are really smart. They're, they're kind of playing on a psychological principle called endowed progress. And so what endowed progress is, is just you know, giving you a little bit of something to keep you moving along without requiring any effort from you. So if you, a good example of that is if you have like a loyalty card or a punch card or something, sometimes you'll get it and they'll be like, oh, I'll just give you, you know, an extra couple punches. Makes you feel really good. Um, you're that much closer to getting $5 off your next meal or whatever it is. Um, it's that same sort of principle that Frank and Oak is really doing a good job of. And I think that's the interesting thing about digital is that there's a lot more psychology now um, when you think about how to design in the digital space. Um, and you really have to, to be aware of that and take that into consideration. So. I was buying a lot of stuff back then. I haven't bought much recently, but <laughs> it's just my wife, don't kill me. Uh, and uh, so yeah, you can see like, it, it ultimately it all adds up and you've got this big reserve of cash. And you're like, this is amazing. They're giving me free stuff. And then I go off and I buy probably $150 worth of stuff when I only have 50 bucks, right? So, so that's, that's another interesting thing happening in digital. Another example I'll show you is, uh, I was at, uh, on a business trip a while ago and you know, this example I wanted to talk about because it's not about a big, fancy, expensive app, um, but really just a, a clever way of leveraging something that's already there. So I went to, I went to the, the Waldorf um, Swanky Hotel and checked in. So they, got, they asked, me, asked me for my phone number, my mobile number, I gave it to them, got up to my room, I get a text, and it says, I was like, oh, okay, cool. Good, good evening, Ms. Rapina, welcome to the Waldorf. Uh, if we can assist you with anything, anytime, simply text us. So I was like, oh wow, that's crazy. I've never actually seen that before. And I said, and I forgot my toothpaste. So let's try this out. So I asked them for toothpaste. They said, yep, we'll send some to your room. I was like, amazing. Um, and so they sent it up, up to my room. And I was like, okay, the floodgates are now open. I am going to... <laughs> see how much I can get out of these guys without actually having to talk to anyone at any point in my stay. So I wake up in the morning and I'm asking them about the shuttle service. They booked it for me. They gave me vouchers. Um, I asked them for um, if I could uh, print out my boarding pass. Uh, they ask, actually, so the good thing here is like, of course, they're, they're smart too, because they go, oh, uh, rate us on how you think we're doing. And at this point, I'm, I'm super excited. So yeah, 10, 10, 10, that's amazing. <laughs> um, and so they're like, that's awesome. And then of course, and then they're like, okay, what can you do for me now? <laughs> so is there a complimentary print station for boarding passes? Yeah, there is, it's the front desk, excellent, thank you. Um, and that, that's kind of that. So I thought that was a really interesting exchange. Um, really good use of digital and it doesn't really cost anything for them, honestly. So, you know, starting a physical, moving to digital, and now, um, you know, I've, I've got those kind of pieces of colored glass in my kaleidoscope, so to speak, right? Um, and now I'm moving into the, the business side of things because I felt like I was, even though I still had a lot of really cool experiences, I still felt like I needed, I was missing some of that, that glass. And uh, specifically around, around business, because when we were doing all these things, it was always the, the business guys that were coming to us and saying, oh, well, what should we do for the, the portfolio? What do you think is the, the, the best strategy for this or that? And we would, we would you know, give them advice and they'd be like, okay, sweet. And then they'd go off and present it. And we're like, hey, man, like, you, just, you just feel slighted, right? And you know, I think there's, a, there's an interesting thing happening with design right now where it's, um, it's moving into a more strategic role. You're seeing designers like in boardrooms and kind of running businesses, doing some really cool stuff when it comes to, to business. So I, I thought to myself, and this was back in 2009, I need to kind of you know, get on that. So, um, so what I did is I decided I wanted to go to my, to do an MBA, but I didn't want to do um, a traditional one. So I ended up going to San Francisco and doing an MBA in design strategy at the California College of the Arts. So MBA at a design school, like think about that for a second, right? So 
huge risk. I was only this, it was the second year of the program they were just starting. Um, really had no idea if it would work out or not. Um, but it turned out to be one of the best experiences of my life. Um, this is the inside of the, the, the kind of what we call the nave. It's, it's a converted Greyhound bus depot. The school is actually pretty cool. Um, and the, the interesting thing is you're going off to do your operations class, your finance, your economics class, and you're running past the fine artists and the, the fashion designers and um, you know, the architects doing their critique in the, in the nave. So you know, if, you, if you want to talk crossover, there are crossovers sitting like, right there. And I got to see it every time I was, was there. Um, it also kicked my ass pretty bad. Um, it was a lot of work. This is probably like 3 a.m. at some point, and this is just one instant, in, instance, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for, for anything. And when, when we were there, we got to do some cool stuff. Like we, you know, we were challenged to recreate the business plan for General Motors. So we, you know, tip, a typical MBA, what is it? We'll probably do a spreadsheet, a bunch of models, um, you know, put together a presentation. We actually wrote a book turned it into like a, a more of a narrative around relationships and love, and we called it the Relove Framework, um, and how people need to fall in love with the GM again. Um, we came up with an idea called Kashimoto, which was like a, a savings platform that was based on people wanting to spend. So you were, you were actually saving, but you were saving because you were spending money. So we, we uh, like total contradiction, right? But what we had found was when we were doing our research that you know, when people think about saving in the brain, it's the same center in the brain that processes pain, which is why no one likes saving, because <laughs> it's just really painful. So we, we actually took that and, and uh, you know, turned it into this, like saving, uh, spending is a new saving was our, was our thing. So, um, so, so now I've, I've done that, I've done, I did that, and now I'm at, uh, I've kind of transitioned into working at Engine, Engine Digital. So I got a, a bunch of the crew here and uh, it's, an, it's, an, it's, a, it's been a really good transition and it's, we've got an amazing group of people uh, at Engine. Um, and it's a really been a, a, an interesting transition because a lot of what, we've, what I, I've had experience in, in kind of in, in school and previously, you know, you, you end up still, it's basically, it's a really smooth transition for me. Like this is uh, just a, a sketch on my office wall. And this is something that we were talking through with one of the CEOs of a, of a company of ours, right? So the, the reason I'm showing this is because of, you know, I think people are starting to respect the ability for someone to jump up in a boardroom, sketch out like an ecosystem really quickly, um, and actually talk through it on the spot as opposed to spend weeks and weeks and time, uh, lots of time on, okay, here's a spreadsheet there, a spreadsheet there, um, here's a PowerPoint presentation. I think the thing with, that designers are really good at are at facilitating conversation and getting all the pieces together that are necessary in order to make a decision. So, you know, we're doing a lot of uh, service design uh, work now. You know, the, the, the perspective is, has grown, right? It's, I started, you know, trying to design a single object and now we're thinking about the digital experience. And now it's like, how, how, does the, how does the business and the actual product or service interact? And what are all those connections and touch points and pieces? And it's led us to, to some really, cool work. So, you know, we have, we've been, had the opportunity to work with the NBA on, on creating a new framework for their team sites. So it's uh, one single framework that allows all the teams in the league to create a customized um, t uh, site. And we, you know, going through our, the entire process and uh, the perspective that I have now, it, it helped me understand, like, why, you know, advertising and to call all the different uh, partner relationships that teams have. You know, if you think of the Lakers versus the Milwaukee Bucks, two very different experiences, but we're trying to de design one thing that, that works for them. So, you know, without taking into consideration the, the business or what really needs to happen um, on that side, you can't really design something that will work, that will be taken up by both the people that are, you know, sponsoring the project and are trying to, to, to um, push it out into the world but also for the, the customers that are there to use it. So we, we, create, we create stuff like this all the time where we you know, take what we're thinking and, and uh, insights that we have, put them uh, out into the world in something that's tangible instead of you know, a more you know, standard doc talking about business numbers and all that sort of stuff, and use that as a means to talk about why this will work for the business. And I think that's, that's that kind of crossover design, design business um, aspect that I'm talking about. And so ultimately, it turns into something like this, where you know we've we've got the final thing. It's it's live now. The season's starting, so you guys can go check out all the NDA work. Um, 
And it's kind of really cool to see something go from just a generic idea, uh, a bunch of discussions, to something that's you know, final and out there in the world and it's actually working and, and performing well. So the uh, last few slides, I mean, for me, when I was thinking about how to wrap this up, I thought, you know, what is crossover really about? And to me, it's crossover is about influence. It's uh, you know, knowing when to be influenced, but also knowing when to be influential. So you, know, you, gotta, you have to take all the pieces, put them together, and only you can make that decision as to like, what the right combination of these pieces are. Um, it's not about just listening to one thing and going off and doing what someone says, but you know, knowing when to, when to take stuff in and when to, to, to push stuff out. So you know, thinking about the, the Funky Drummer Break by James Brown, um, that's, that's, the, that's, their base, that's the baseline for a lot of music. And I think when you understand that really clearly, you can create really cool stuff. So freestyle over the James Brown funk drummer beat, um, pretty awesome. There's Eminem and uh, Black Thought also do the same thing in, in this video, but check it out if you want, it's, it's pretty sweet. So I'll leave you this. Uh, so what is your sample? What do you base your, what do you base your creativity on? Uh, thanks. In, um, I'm pretty sure you work with uh, many multidisciplinary people uh, that come from all sorts of backgrounds. And, and when you have, let's say, um, you're in a problem solving scenario and you have clients or people that, um, that have one particular idea, but your idea that you feel really strongly about is going the opposite direction from what you're thinking, how do you get those two parties to meet? Right. Um, so I think working in, in digital actually is a good thing for that, that sort of problem because it al allows you to create stuff really quickly, really cheaply, um, and get ideas out into the world. So I guess my answer to that would be um, try to get something tangible done up and out as quickly as possible um, and try to figure out where it's broken um, as soon as you can. Uh, versus trying to build something and spending a, a lot of time polishing it before you actually get that feedback. Um, especially when you have to convince different, different types of people. I mean, even working in our own studio, you've got you know, different opinions on things, so we've got to sort that out. And then working with the clients and the, and the clients' bosses and all that who may not be design-oriented, who are very focused on like, the business, the ROI, and all that sort of stuff, you need to kind of make, make, be able to turn those things into their language. And, and show them something that they can wrap their head around. So that's the reason I showed some of those examples is you know, being able to throw wireframes together in something that's interactive and clickable. You can actually show it on a, on a phone. All of a sudden, it's real. It's not just an idea. It's not just a concept. And you know, sitting, walking into a, a meeting and saying, OK, everyone, pull out your phones. We'll, we'll send you a link to what we're talking about. And having discussions based on people clicking through like, their actual device suddenly makes it like, oh, yeah, this can, this, I can see this happening. So. Thank you. All right. Questions? Hi, that was really fascinating. OK, sorry, I forgot. I'm just actually curious if you could share um, some of the UX design that you're really inspired by. Oh, that's a good question. Um, oh, I just want to say thank you first before I answer that. Thank you for all the tweets. My pocket's been buzzing <laughs> a, a lot, so it's nice. Um, yeah, so I think that the. the the UX design, the things that I'm like really impressed by and inspired by now, are the things that make, you know, everyday things really seamless um, and really effortless. So I think about I think about Uber right away. Um, to, it's just sad that Vancouver doesn't have it anymore, but you know, things like that where they've taken a pretty common experience, something that everyone's familiar familiar with, and hit on a couple of things. One is, you know, made it really convenient to get from one place to another because you don't have to pay. Like, that's the one thing I always hate about taking a cab is the whole payment bit at the end. And you know, fumbling with a card, the guy's like, oh, you're paying me with a card, um, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, but at the same time, I think that's one thing. The other, the other thing is that Uber makes you feel like a, a rock star. Um, and it's, like, that's, that's the thing I think that they've hit on. And I still remember the first time I, I, I rode in an Uber, and it was in San Francisco. And I just took so many photos of that experience and talked about it to everybody. So I mean, I think they've, they've hit like just a very basic 
you know, usability issue, but they've also really hit the emotional side of things, which is why I think they're, they're really taking off. Thanks, that was really interesting. Um, one of the things we were talking about was um, you didn't mention sort of cultural crossover mm. and how training thought comes into your work. Yeah, I, I was struggling with putting that into the presentation actually because uh, I thought a lot about I thought a lot about culture and cultural crossover as part of my work too. Just kind of a natural extension of it, and. Um, Working with in, in the gaming industry for a while, I think that was actually the first time that I really kind of thought about it a lot because we were working, you know, creating products that were being shipped around the world, but also working with other designers and other teams at agencies that were in completely different countries. So we were working with an agency or a studio in Korea that had a very, very different idea of what a user experience should be, like how much information should be on the screen, like how they present stuff. So if you if you if you see like uh, Asian kind of Japanese type stuff it's it's really busy like there's lots of stuff on the screen um, there's lots of information and you know what we tend to do in the in the Western world is look for simplicity and minimalism and like really pairs things down whereas they're really comfortable with having a lot of stuff so I, I thought oh why, why is that the case and we were having a lot of trouble kind of coming to a solution that was good would fit both parties so I actually stumbled across um, a psychologist called Geert Hofstede, and I've talked about his work before, and he actually created a, a framework called the Power Distance Index um, that he used to train like managers at IBM, and he had broken down different cultures based on these five parameters um, to, to show really how people are different and why they're different. So I, I, just as a fun exercise, I actually went, okay, well, what's, what is, what's Korea like versus Canada or the US? And it turned out on all the parameters, they were the complete opposite, right? So. We, we ended up bringing that to them when we met with them and say, okay, well, I think this is why we're having issues. Um, you know, we're all, and they're like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense because each one of those parameters specified like, okay, well, you know, in, in Asia, it's about hierarchy and about, um, you know, having a, a, a order to things and versus, you know, it's different here or whatever, right? So I, th I think a lot about culture and a lot about like how that impacts both design and also the organizations that are responsible for design. Okay, sure. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so let me repeat the question because you don't have the mic. So uh, basically you're saying I'm an asshole because I like those things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking, I'm just joking. Um, so it's, um, so it was, the question was around ethics and UX and how, how, does you, how do UX designers have, uh, how can UX designers be ethical, I guess? Or how do you, how do you balance ethics and, and UX design? Wow, I feel really awesome right now. Uh, <laughs> it's a it's a really good good question, and I think I don't I don't know if I can even give you a good answer uh, right now. But I think a, a lot of it does have to do with you know what what do you hold as your your own beliefs? Because you know you the, you can see that there's actual sites called dark dark UX, and you can talk about like dark UX patterns and and ways of kind of manipulating people in a in a really negative way. And I think actually the gaming industry is really bad for this too. Like when you think about like online gaming, Farmville and all that sort of stuff. Like I remember being in, in meetings where it was all about, oh, how can we squeeze another like, you know, 50 cents or a dollar out of someone based on the mechanics that we're designing into the game, right? So honestly, I think it's, the only way you can get around that is being very specific in terms of who you work with, like the clients that you choose to work with and the, the industries you work with. Cause you know, there's, there's one thing to say like Uber, th that experience is awesome. Like I don't, I don't disagree with that. I still think that that experience is awesome. But the fact that they're going off and trying to poach Lyft drivers and like doing all this like stupid stuff, ignoring regulations in cities and all that sort of thing, I don't agree with that at all, right? But I, I, I think that that's, 
there's, there's two separate parts of the coin and that comes down to the leadership and to the, the, the people running those, those companies. And you know, as a UX designer, you can either choose to, to, to jump on board with them or you kind of choose to do something else. Have you made any of those choices? <laughs> wow. <laughs> can I go now? <laughs> this is... <laughs> you, got, you got three more minutes. <laughs> This is, this is crazy. <laughs> have I made any of those choices? Yes, I have. Um, well, I, I, I left the gaming industry, um, partly because I, I didn't like how that was, that was going. Um, I think we, we spent too much time on talking about virality and you know, influence and whales, whales being like people that spent thousands of dollars on like virtual pets and currency and all that sort of stuff, right? Like there are actually people in the world that spend thousands of dollars a month on these games, right? And to me, like I just didn't feel comfortable with that, so I couldn't, I couldn't be around. Uh, we're having an interesting discussion about uh, innovation in the in the creative process. Thinking about your sampling ex examples, crossover, talking about some uh, uh, examples related to music and trying to think about that in the, in the context of the design process where, uh, and thinking about copyright and uh, patent violations mm -hmm. as an impediment to that, but also how innovation can itself be an impediment, a constraint, if you're trying to get a new idea all the time. So how would you uh, break through that? I th yeah, I, th I, th I think so. It's I get nervous about that thing. <laughs> <laughs> I can speak plainly without it. But sure, yeah, could, please, if you could just elaborate a little bit. That'd be good. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if you're you can be constrained by the prospect of uh, doing something new all the time, right? Yeah. Do it new, do it a new way. Maybe you lose sight of what the whole purpose of UX is. So what are some kind of strategies or methods for breaking through mm. that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think it's really about, um, I wouldn't say sanity checking your idea, but kind of getting the, your idea out of your head. Because I think what, what, what I kind of get from you or the, what I think of immediately when you, when you ask that question is that being kind of drunk with the idea of like, oh, if I just do a little bit more, I just do a little bit more, it's, it's going to be perfect. Um, and just keep on, you know, just keep on like spending time burning energy on that. And at the same time, it just, it's, it's still in your head, right? It just stays there. So I think the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that you, know, you, you want to get it out quicker um, and not get, not get uh, caught up with the idea of the new or the kind of the beauty of the, of the new and kind of innovative thing. Um, and that's even the way we think about like how we do our work at, at Engine, right? Is we're not about the big reveal. We're about kind of revealing pe bits and pieces as we, as we come through and being open to that process and the critique that happens when you're not actually showing something that you personally feel like it's perfect. Because um, if, if you wait until that time, then most often than not, someone else has already done it. Um, and it's out in the world and you're like, oh, that was my idea, I should have done that, so. It's like fast prototyping. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I want to actually, one last question, okay, last question. I'm going to give you the mic. How much of what we do is experimental? How much of what we do is experimental? Yeah. <sighs> I think, a, I think a lot of it is, exper it depends on how you define experimental, but I think a lot of it is e experimental, to be honest, because um, we, we realize very quickly that when we, we come up with something, if, if it's, it feels stale and it feels dated, um, it just becomes obvious really quick, right? Like you'll come up with an idea and all of a sudden like we'll talk to someone in, in the office and they'll be like, oh, like this? And, and then they show, they show it and it's the worst feeling ever, right? <laughs> Um, so it, it really causes you to, to push really quickly. And I think I would say everything we do is like experimental to some sense. We're always playing with new technologies, new ways of doing things, new ways of delivering um, the experiences that we're trying to figure out. So it's experimental in that sense, yeah. Okay, that was the last question. I want to make sure everyone gets started by 10. So let's give another round of applause for Ryan.